reason. Today's text says that when the sons of Israel went astray, Zadok and his sons did not go astray, but they kept the charge in his sanctuary. What does that mean? To put it simply, when all of Israel betrayed God, sons of Zadok did not. This person named Zadok did not. He kept his place. He kept his faith. He was faithful. So that's why God is going to bless his descendants. So now here, when it says the sons of Zadok, what, who exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about his physical fleshly descendants? Because right now, a couple of thousand years later, 3,000 years later, I don't think we could find any true descendants of Zadok today, right? So what does the Bible mean? It means it's talking about, for example, when it talks about the sons of Abraham, descendants of Abraham, who is it talking about? It's talking about people who had faith like Abraham, right? When it's talking about sons of David being blessed, it's talking about people who had faith like David. So when it's talking about sons of Zadok here, it's the same thing. People who were faithful until the end like Zadok. Those are the ones that God will let enter into the new Jerusalem and serve God. So all who are faithful to God in the midst of hardships, in the midst of trials, and in the midst of a time where everybody else is betraying God, those are the true descendants of Zadok. So let's study a little bit about Zadok's history. Number one, Zadok was faithful to David during Absalom's rebellion. Remember Absalom, he was David's third son. Very handsome, right? What did he try to do though? He tried to revolt against his own father and take the throne. He drove his own father out of Jerusalem and he tried to usurp the throne by starting a rebellion, right? And that is when Zadok remained faithful to David. He came with the Ark of the Covenant. While David was running away from uh, Jerusalem, the Bible says he ran out barefoot because he didn't have time to put on his shoes. That's how urgent the situation was. And Zadok the priest came with the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, we will go with you because you're the true king. Because you're the king that God made a covenant with, right? But David said, no, 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 no. This is happening to me because of something I did wrong. Okay? If God wants to kill me, he's going to kill me. If God wants to save me, then he'll save me. But you're a priest, you're a seer. You need to be in the temple. So David sent him back. But nonetheless, Zadok was faithful to David. So what does this incident teach us today? What's the redemptive historical meaning of this incident? Absalom's rebellion reminds us of the many great rebellions in redemptive history. There were many times in history that people revolted against God. Okay? First time was obviously in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. It was a great rebellion. What was the reason that Adam disobeyed God and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what was Adam's motivation behind disobeying God's word? Is he wanted to be like God. He wanted to sit on the throne that God was on. He wanted to be God of his life. So, in fact, it was a rebellion. It was a spiritual rebellion. They disobeyed because they wanted God out of their life, and they wanted to be God. Do we sometimes do this in our lives today? Is, is, does this happen? Do we willfully rebel against God, even though we know that he is God, that he is the sovereign? Do we sometimes do that? If so, then we must repent. That's a 
very serious sin. Another great rebellion that happened in redemptive history is Satan's rebellion. We may have heard of the story of Lucifer, who was one of the archangels, and he rebelled against God, and so he became Satan, right? That's recorded in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12, 12 through 14. It says, How you have fo- fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. This expression, star of the morning, in Latin is Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. Same thing, right? What, it, what was Lucifer trying to do? He wanted to be like God. He wanted to rival God. He wanted to sit on God's throne. And what was worse about Absalom's rebellion is that it was his own son. It wasn't somebody else, right? It was his own flesh and blood, right? It wasn't like some general... It wasn't a cousin or a brother. It was his son. That hurts the most, right? And it was the same with God. Lucifer was supposedly an archangel, one of the highest angels. Adam, the Bible says, was God's son, whom he created. He loved. He made the Garden of Eden for him. See, throughout history, and you see in movies, it's always the person that's closest to you who puts the dagger behind your back, right? And the same thing happened in redemptive history as well. In the Bible, there are several words for sin, okay? But I want to teach you about three words today. The the general word for sin is hatat, okay? Hatat. You would spell it something like this in English. This is the the most general word for sin. It's the most widely used. What does it mean? This word literally means to miss the mark. Okay? So when you shoot an arrow, it doesn't hit the bullseye, but it misses the mark. That's what hatat means. That is sin. In other words, we have fallen short of the glory of God. This could be a willful missing of the mark, but... A lot of times it's unintentional, right? Because we're fallen human beings, hatat, we miss the mark unintentionally. And it, we deviate from the right way because we are weak. And that's a very forgivable sin. If you repent, that is forgivable. The second word for sin is avan. And this word is usually translated as iniquity in the NASB Bible. And what does avan mean? It literally means perverseness or crookedness. It's not straight, but it's crooked. And it's perverse. So it signifies a lack of integrity. A person who commits avan is a person who is deceptive. They don't have integrity. They're not upright. And it usually refers to a willful deviation from the right path. So this sin is a little bit more serious because this person knows that this is the right way to go and yet they willfully go the other way or or another way because they feel like it. They like that better. And all human beings do this, right? Because sometimes sin seems to be more pleasurable. So you willfully choose that way. And then the third final word for sin is pesha. This is what I wanted to get at here. Pesha. What does pesha mean? It's usually translated as transgression. But it literally means Rebellion. 
okay, or revolt. It is a willful refusal to subject yourself to God's authority. So it's a deliberate challenge to God's authority, deliberate defiance and rebellion against God. And this is what Absalom did. He planned it out. I'm going to kill my father, and I'm going to be king in his place. It was a willful, deliberate rebellion. And Pesha is associated with breaking of the covenant. So when we break the covenant, this is the sin that we're committing. So all three of these words are interchangeable. You could use them for sin in any context. But when you get specific, it has these meanings. So out of the three, Pesha seems to be the most serious kind of sin. Because it's a willful, deliberate sin. This kind of sin is usually committed by somebody who knows God, who believed in God. An unbeliever really can't commit this kind of a sin. Because you have to know what is right and what is wrong. And yet you still choose to do what's wrong. So as I said before, it's always the person that's closest to you that betrays you, right? It's the same with God. These people all believed in God. And yet they betrayed God. It was the children of God that committed Peshaw. Not some Gentile. It was David's son who committed this great revolt against him. Another time or instance in the Bible where this kind of rebellion occurs is in the book of Revelation where it talks about the great city Babylon. We have learned that the world that we're living in today, the sinful world, is Babylon, right? And what happened in Babylon? In Revelation chapter 11 verse 8 it says, and their bo dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So this great city here is Babylon. And it's also known as Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually, they're the same place. And what happened here? It says that our Lord was crucified there. They killed Jesus in Babylon. Historically, we know that Jesus died in Jerusalem, right? But spiritually speaking, the people who killed Jesus are Babylon. And in the world today, in the sinful world, they are crucifying Jesus every single day. So, why did they kill Jesus? What was the reason? If you look in Matthew 21, it's the parable that Jesus gave about the landowner. And this is what he says. He says, but afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Why did they kill Jesus? The son that they're talking about here is Jesus, right? Why did they kill Jesus? Because they wanted to take his place. They wanted his inheritance. They wanted his throne. It was a revolt by these vine growers against God himself. So this is happening every day in human lives. Many times we revolt and rebel against God. But Zadok remained faithful when Absalom revolted against David. Secondly, Zadok remained faithful to Solomon as well. So Zadok was a high priest even in the reign of Solomon. When David was about to die, the sons of David, especially this one son named Adonijah, wanted to be the next king. So again, Adonijah plans to take the throne after David. But David had already made up his mind that Solomon would be the next king. And at this time, during this time, there were two high priests. One was Zadok, the other was Abiathar. 
Abiathar sided with Adonijah. But Zadok sided with Solomon. So, let me ask you this. Do you think this was politically motivated? Zadok and Abiathar, right? You just choose the guy who you think is going to be the next king, right? Or you choose the guy who you think will benefit you the most, right? Well, for Abiathar, that was the case. The Bible says Adonijah was also very handsome like Absalom. And he was very outgoing. He had a plan. He wanted to become the next king. He had support from Joab and various other people. So Abiathar probably thought, okay, it seems like this guy's going to be the next king. I'll stick with him. But for Zadok, that was not the reason. Why do I say that? Because in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 9 and 10, it says, Behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So here, this is the contents of the Davidic covenant. When God made a covenant with David, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the same content is there, but it does not give the name of the son Solomon. But here in 1 Chronicles, it reveals that God had already told David even before Solomon was born, that the next king will be named Solomon. So God had already prophesied this. Solomon was to be the next king. And Zadok knew this. So that is why Zadok stood with Solomon. Because it seems that Adonijah is older than Solomon. So if you were to go according to age, he was supposed to be king first. But Zadok didn't think in human terms like that. He thought in covenantal terms. The one whom God has covenanted, he will be the king. And he's going to be the one to build the temple. So from that day on, Abiathar was removed from the high priesthood. Because he sided with the wrong guy. Solomon became king and Zadok became the sole high priest. Because he was faithful. So the life of Zadok shows us what true righteousness is. And what is that? Righteousness in the biblical sense is covenant faithfulness. And that's the life of Zadok. He was faithful to the covenant. So what is righteousness? It's covenant faithfulness, right? Keeping promises, being faithful to God's word. Because God is faithful to his word, so we must be faithful to his covenants as well. You know, nowadays people just make promises and they break it. It's, our words have become nothing, right? It's meaningless. We take it so lightly, but that's not how it's supposed to be. We are humans in the image of God, right? God spoke the word and the universe came to be. The word of God is that powerful. And if we are in the image of God, our words also can have power. Because we're his children. But we, our words will only have power when we are covenantly, covenant faithful or faithful to the covenant. But we don't do that. People in this world, in this day and age, they say something and they just take it back. They lie like it's nothing. That's one of the biggest problems of this day and age. We have to be faithful to our word and faithful to God's word. So, the life of Zadok shows us and sets an example of somebody who is faithful to the covenant of God. Well, the Bible says no human being has been faithful like this. Right? In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, it says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. 
There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. I mean, you think God is trying to emphasize something here? He says none, none, none. Nobody's good. Nobody's righteous. Nobody believes. So what is the life of Zadok trying to teach us today? First and foremost, it's foreshadowing the life of Jesus Christ, who was faithful to the covenant on our behalf. This morning, I talked about the covenant of redemption, right? That's the covenant that God made with Jesus before the foundation of the world. So before God even created the universe, he, had already, he already knew that the human being that he would create would fall and sin and betray God. So he was already starting to prepare for that, and he already planned for our redemption before he even made us. And when he planned that redemption, the plan was that his son Jesus would go in human form and in die, he would die on our behalf for our sins. And God said to Jesus, will you do this? Will you take the sins of all mankind? And Jesus said, yes, amen, I will. And he obeyed. That's why we are saved today. Because Jesus was faithful to the covenant. So in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See? He was obedient to the point of death. He obeyed all of the covenants that God had given to him. So when we believe in Jesus, his righteousness is given to us. And our sins are given to Jesus. So there is this exchange that took place on the cross. His righteousness became ours, and our sins became his. So now that we know this fact, and now we believe in this, that Jesus died for us like this, our lives should be different, right? We should change. Now we should look to Zadok and think, we have to become the descendants of Zadok. We have to be faithful like him. Because we want to be the servants serving God in New Jerusalem, right? So I want to tell you a story about a dog. Have you guys heard of that Japanese dog? Hachiko? <laughs> did, you, did you guys see this movie? I haven't seen this movie. But I heard about it. So what is this story about? It's this dog. Apparently, the, this dog has a birthday. He was born in 1923 uh, in Japan. So he had, his owner was some professor at a university. And the owner would come by train, by subway every day. And he would get off at the Shibuya station. So the dog came to meet the owner every day. The dog was very smart, I guess. He came to the station to meet the owner every day. But then two years later, the owner died of cancer. So that's in 1925, right? But the story goes that the dog came to the station every day for the next nine years until he died. Every day, Hachiko came, came to the station to meet his owner for nine years, right? So I guess they have a statue of the dog in Japan. So why am I telling you this? I'm not telling you to go buy, uh, buy a Japanese dog or anything like that. But I'm saying this because even animals are loyal like this. But are human beings faithful? The Bible says they are not. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, an ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So God is saying, Israel is worse than the animals. Because these animals are faithful to its owner. They do what the owner tells it to do. But Israel does not. Israel is consistently and constantly betraying and rebelling against God. 
and not just Israel, but all human beings are. And that's why in today's text it says, when all of Israel went astray, Zadok remained with me, so his descendants will serve me in the new Jerusalem. What a tremendous blessing that is, right? That's the blessing that we should be seeking for today. And to get that blessing, we must be faithful to God's covenant. We must be faithful to the word. We have to be loyal, right? In Hebrew, the word is hesed. It's one of the most important words in the Old Testament. It signifies covenantal love, covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty. This is the kind of love that God has for us. So we should reciprocate by having the same kind of love for him. And when we do that, when we are faithful like Zadok, then we will be his servants in the new Jerusalem. So in Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, it says, In the new Jerusalem, there will be no longer any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants, that's us, will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. See? Those of us who will be faithful like Zadok will see God face to face and we will serve him there forever. And also in Revelation chapter 7 verses 14 through 17, it says, I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So in other words, these people remain faithful even through the great tribulation. So what, how does God reward them? It says, for this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. When we are faithful, God is faithful to us. So this is the promise that he has set before us. That if we are faithful like Zadok, then we will serve him in the New Jerusalem, and he will lead us to the springs of the water of life. There will be no longer any hunger or thirst or mourning or death. No tears. God will comfort us. God will protect us. God will be with us. So the point is this, we must not rebel. We must be faithful to his word. Covenant loyalty is what God is seeking for. So in the History of Redemption series, book six, it says, we, Zadok sets an example of a person whom God could rely on, God could trust on. He's a trustworthy high priest. When we think of ourselves, are we like this? Are we trustworthy? That God could say, oh, if I, if I give this work or this job to this person, he or she will do it. I trust him. That's the kind of people that we need to try to become. Because we're weak and frail, we may make mistakes and fail at times, but we must keep trying. And through God's help, I believe that we will all become faithful priests like Zadok and his descendants. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for calling us to become your children in this day and age where the world is filled with darkness and yet you have called us into your light and given us your word and you have cleansed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we thank you and give you all glory and honor at this time. Father God, as we have learned about Zadok the high priest, help us to become faithful and loyal to your word like he was. May we never go astray from you, Lord, but may we remain faithful even in the, in the face of hardships and trials so that we may be able to serve you in the new Jerusalem. We thank you so much for the blessing that you have given to us, the gift of faith, and the word of God that you have given to us. So as an expression of our thanksgiving, we want to give this offering to you. Please bless this offering so that it may be used for your will, for your glory, and for your kingdom. 
and bless the hands that are giving so that they may receive the blessing of wealth that comes without any sorrows. And may all of our prayers be delivered to your throne of grace along with our offerings. And please answer each and every one of our prayers so that we may know and believe and be assured that our living God is with us, watching over us and walking with us day by day. We thank you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.